Thank you very much. Stefano, in fact, ICTP is a very special place for me because this was my first major international conference. This was in 1998, much before uh, I went to PhD. And somehow, so this hall has many very special associations. So in fact, uh, I would like to talk about PAM measures for some special kind of processes, determinantal point processes. But since uh, uh, this is a basic notion seminar, let me start with some uh, history of uh, theory of point processes. And I follow here the exposition in Daily via Jones, the classical text on the theory of point processes. And in fact, our story starts in the 17th century when uh, John Grant uh, investigated the London bills of mortality, so lists uh, which were compiled in parishes of London of um, people who were born, people who died, and so forth. So his work is now on the World Wide Web. It's a pioneering work in many respects. And let me just start with a little preface. Uh, uh, let me just start with a little fragment from the dedication. So the work is dedicated to Lord Roberts, a member of His Majesty's Privy Council. And so Grant uh, starts, well, in a customary manner by saying that uh, my lord, uh, presenting some learning to you is useless because you already know everything. So everything that's contained in books, you know already. But, continues Grant, my ob so, so uh, to present you something uh, which is already in other books, were but to derogate from your lordship's learning, which the world knows to be universal, and so on. But then he says, so what, what observations he draws from the bills of mortality? So, and he says, uh, uh, just, okay, so it does not ill become a member of His Majesty Council to consider how few staff of the many who beg, uh, how uh, wasting of males in wars do not prejudice the due proportion between them and females. I skip some items. That London, the metropolis of England, is perhaps a head too big for the body and possibly too strong, that this head grows three times as fast as the body unto which it belongs. And so on, and so on, and so on, that the old streets are unfit for the present frequency of coaches. When you read this, you see that nothing much has changed. And so uh, the point in the study of Grant, what Grant really studied, was the frequency of event, uh, somehow the statistics of deaths. So this concept was then continued by very many mathematicians. So Halley, Halley continued the investigations of Grant, then there was Huygens, then Moivre suggested the fir a first very simple model. So uh, the concept is very simple. One uh, considers some population, and uh, then uh, there is a probability, S of X, probability that lifetime is greater than X. So one considers some sample population, and, well, the members of this population die at some point, and one considers this probability that lifetime is greater than X. And, uh, well, uh, so uh, Moivre proposed the model that S of X Yes? Okay, better? Okay? Uh -huh. So Moivre proposed a model whereby uh, S of X decreases linearly between, decreases linearly between ages of, between ages of 22 and 86. So it becomes, it becomes uh, obviously uh, less and less probable, and then, well, the uh, probability after uh, 86 was considered uh, to be zero. Uh, then this question was also studied by such mathematicians as Laplace and Euler, and in particular, one important quantity that is considered is Q of X dx, which is probability that lifetime terminates, probability lifetime terminates terminates b 
between x and x plus dx, provided that it hasn't terminated, provided that it did not, it did not terminate before x. Not terminate before x. So, and in fact, the model which is used even to this day uh, is uh, the model of uh, Gompertz, whereby this probability grows uh, exponentially. So, this probability density grows exponentially. Okay, so uh, the whole uh, point of this very preliminary discussion is that uh, first of all, the very concept of studying sequences of indistinguishable events, uh, which, uh, however, which occur at random intervals, such as precisely in this example, uh, deaths of members of a given population. This goes back to very old, uh, very old. Well, uh, Grant's book appears in. 60 something, uh, and just after the restoration, 69, I think. And uh, um, uh, some of the uh, best mathematicians in the history of our science thought about this problem. So, new impetus arrived uh, when telephone companies appeared, and telephone companies were interested in reducing the waiting time for their customers. So, in fact, this problem was uh, uh, important as late as the 1960s. It is enough to think of the opera of uh, Poulenc, uh, La Voix Humaine, where, in fact, the dialogue of the characters is constantly interrupted by phone troubles. So, uh, just, uh, in fact, it was engineers who considered, who introduced the so-called Poisson process. So Poisson did consider the Poisson distribution, but he did not really consider the Poisson process. And it was introduced by engineers in Scandinavian countries who worked for phone companies. So we uh, recall very briefly, uh, this part of the talk is uh, basic and also not very rigorous, but the uh, second part will be much more rigorous. So we recall that in Poisson process, uh, which is considered on the line, uh, there is a sequence of events, uh, and uh, uh, just events arrive at random intervals. So, for example, arrival of phone call at phone stations or many other things. And the main idea of uh, the main, the definition of Poisson interval is that uh, the number, numbers of, numbers of events in disjoint intervals are independent. Numbers of events in disjoint, numbers of events in disjoint interval are independent. In disjoint interval. Intervals are independent. Are independent. And the process is stationary, so it doesn't, uh, it is, all the probabilities are shift invariant, so stationary. So this already allows, in a relatively straightforward way, uh, to show that the distribution, the probability of k calls arriving in given moment of time, in given, excuse me, interval of length t, is in fact, has Poisson distribution. So, uh, this is probability k calls arrive in interval 0 t. Okay, where well, lambda is the frequency of calls. And then um, very many Poisson processes is very convenient in that uh, many, very many things can be computed. And uh, uh, in fact, with this uh, process, is, uh, 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 this process has the waiting time paradox, or uh, it has many names, waiting time paradox, or uh, uh, inspection paradox, and so on. So waiting time paradox is uh, the following statement. So let us uh, imagine that these are not just calls arriving at phone station, but maybe these are buses. Buses arriving to a bus stop in Grignano. Well, in Grignano, they arrive very uh, punctually, but maybe if it is bus stop in the south of Italy, then maybe it's not the same. So, uh, for example, let's imagine some bus stop where the buses arrive according to Poisson law. 
then imagine that we come to the bus stop exactly at 8 a.m. every morning. So here we are at 8 a.m. So uh, then we can ask ourselves, so lambda is the frequency of the bus. We can ask ourselves how long shall we wait for the next bus. So it can be computed that the waiting time for the next bus is lambda. OK, we can ask ourselves how much time elapsed before the previous bus. But the previous bus, before the previous bus, the time that elapsed is also, on average, lambda. We can ask ourselves what is the in interval between two consecutive buses. But this interval is also lambda. So this seems to yield a contradiction. So let us consider the opposite problem. So in Grignano, where buses come exactly on schedule, like every, let's say, 15 minutes, imagine now we come at random time. So we come uniform random time. So what would be average time of waiting? It will be half of the interval. So if buses come every 15 minutes, we will, on average, wait seven and a half minutes. Sometimes we will come and the bus will just arrive. Sometimes we'll come, we will wait for long. Uh, the bus will just have left, but these things will compensate. And so interval between buses will be equal to average time until next bus plus average time since the previous bus. So if buses go exactly on schedule. So then there is no paradox. But here there is this paradox. This is lambda, this is lambda, and this is lambda. So in fact, uh, the solution to the paradox uh, lies in the fact that when I say average waiting time, uh, average, uh, how do you say, it's like many paradoxes in probability theory in that there is uh, expectation is taken with respect to different probability distributions. And this is why uh, the sum formula doesn't work. So in fact, this lambda is expectation taken with respect to the palm measure, whereas this is expectation taken with respect to the initial measure. And this is the solution to the paradox. In more, uh, how shall I say, in more common sense terms, if I come exactly every day, I come exactly at 8 a.m., it is more probable, th so I will more often hit long intervals than short ones. Long intervals will come my way more often than short ones, and this is why waiting time is so long. Okay, so studying this uh, waiting time paradox, by the way, waiting time paradox arises not just, is not specific to the Poisson process, it uh, is, uh, for example, it holds in full generality for all so-called renewal processes. I don't want to talk about renewal processes, uh, which, as, which one can uh, think informally as a process whereby, uh, say, I have some uh, device which breaks up and then has to be replaced by a new one, but it's the same device, but it breaks at random intervals. And so uh, I must know how often I have to effectuate these replacements. And, uh, the same waiting time paradox is uh, holds, and in fact, a very short and elegant uh, argument is on uh, Wikipedia in the in the under the heading renewal process. So it's possible to uh, it's possible to explain. Uh, they, it explains completely why this interval is always longer than this interval. The interval which I hit is always longer than the interval between two consecutive occurrences. So thinking about this paradox, uh, one of the main characters of the story, Konrad Palm, who was an engineer working for Ericsson uh, before he, was, he joined uh, the Royal Institute of Technology and who lived a tragically short life. Uh, so uh, Konrad Palm suggested to consider the following function, which he called Palm, palm function. This is function phi naught of x. So he considers stationary flow. They always consider stationary flow. Stationary flow. So and he proposed to consider phi naught of x, which is a probability that in interval, interval, let's say, Let's say, uh, let's say final of u, it doesn't have final, it will t, t plus u. No event has occurred, has occurred, uh, 
And now comes this important point, provided an event occurred at time t. So it is a separate question why such probability can even be defined. It is usually defined by limit transition by taking interval, by taking two intervals. So here is t, here is t plus u. Then I take small interval t, t minus delta, and I consider conditional probability of event here and nothing here conditioned on this event here, and I take the limit. Something like this is how Palm, well, Palm, in fact, was not even interested in questions of justification, but this is how one can give rigorous, rigorous treatment of Palm functions. So this is, uh, uh, the, uh, this is the discovery of Conrad Palm, that the importance of studying such conditional functions. And, uh, but uh, the fundamental work of Palm, it was all, however, of course, on physical level of rigor. It was not rigorous, not rigorous work. And so then, uh, Alexander Yakovlevich Hinchin, uh, uh, in fact, in a fundamental work, which uh, uh, has uh, not lost its importance and which is really remarkably well written, uh, I have some trouble translating its title. I will modernize it in English terms. Uh, the Russian title, Teoria Masova Obsluzhevania, in English is translated as queuing theory. So I will give modern English translation, queuing theory. This is... Uh, proceedings of the Steklov Institute of 1955. It's a separate volume, volume 49. So this fundamental monograph gave rigorous foundations to the theory of, uh, in fact, queuing theory and, in fact, to theory of stationary point processes. So the idea of Palm was that one can, from this probability, get the process back, get the stationary process back. In fact, it's not enough. Uh, this phi naught is not enough. It is necessary to consider uh, more general palm functions. So Hinchin gave uh, uh, to these functions the name of palm functions. And so it is also function phi k of u, which is probability, so it's the same. Uh, okay, let me just write it here, phi k of u is probability that in an interval at most k events occurred, at most k events occurred, uh, provided that no event occurred at time t. Uh, excuse me. No, uh, at most k events occurred, provided an event occurred at time t. No, it's written correctly. Excuse me. Here it is. Yes. So phi k. And the collection, so the palm Hinchin theorem is that the collection of these functions, phi k u, determines the, pro, determines the stationary process. The stationary process. So this is the palm Hinchin theorem. The stationary process. Hinchin theorem. So, uh, in fact, one can write a very simple very simple uh, equations. If this probability, this one denotes as vk of t, these are basic functions of a stationary process which determine it uniquely, then in fact the palm Hinchin equations, so here are the palm Hinchin equations, equations uh, say the following, that v naught of t, well, this is hardly very surprising that the probability of no calls is found by integrating the conditional probability. It is, in fact, very much to be expected. And then vk of t is just lambda integral from 0 to t phi k minus 1 of u minus phi k of u. Uh, 
So, and the proof of, uh, I follow the notation uh, of uh, the book by Hinchin, and the proof can be, the proof uh, occupies more or less a page, and can be also found in the book of Hinchin, which had this fundamental importance for development of the theory of point processes. So now uh, the very concept of this palm measure, uh, how do I say, uh, this was uh, the discussion from the point of view of engineering applications. But uh, it, is, uh, it is desirable uh, to construct a mathematical framework for the study of these palm functions or palm measures and, of course, this definition is not satisfactory from many points of view, and in particular also because there is this limit transition, which is a little bit awkward. It is not clear for what processes it can be defined. It is not completely clear how to carry it to many dimensions. And so uh, I would like to now, now I stop with the informal part of the talk and I switch to more rigorous part, now I would like to uh, explain the modern approach to palm measures. Uh, so palm measures through Campbell measures, and uh, I'm not completely sure uh, how to uh, uh, properly assign credit for these beautiful constructions, but so palm measures through Campbell measures measures through Campbell measures. So, but uh, my reference is the work of Olaf Kallenberg. So, Campbell, by the way, was also, one can say, not exactly a mathematician. So, he was engineer and uh, just physicist and uh, philosopher of science. Okay, so I follow uh, Kallenberg. Okay, so uh, we let us first explain ourselves what do we mean by point process. So uh, we have so far had a very informal definition. Now let us have formal definition, which will also be suitable for many dimensions. So we consider uh, phase space E, which is in our situation, especially for the purpose of the talk today, it is... Uh, one can think that E is something like R, Z, or C, so nothing more fancy. Uh, formally, it's a, a complete, separable, locally compact metric space. Uh, uh, locally compact as assumption is useful. So uh, there is then the space of configurations on E. The space of configurations on E is the space, in fact, of subsets of E. X is a configuration, X is a subset of E, such that uh, X intersected with any bounded set is finite. So I will denote cardinality of a set uh, by the sharp sign, and uh, uh, so B bounded, bounded, so this is finite. Okay, so I will denote, I will write, it will be convenient for me to introduce notation. This one, hash b of x, is precisely number of... So points of the set x are called particles. I can even write it like this. x is the set of some small x, and these x are called particles. So these are configurations of particles, and every bounded set contains only finitely many particles. In fact, we do not expect infinitely many phone calls to arrive at a phone station at the same time. Number of, number of uh, particles in B, of X in B, so. Okay, so uh, since uh, this is a basic notion seminar, I will be light on formal details, but uh, let me point out that these functions determine the Borel structure on this space and also that assigning to every x the corresponding Radon measure, we also obtain uh, complete, we also turn the space of configurations in a complete metric space, but uh, com complete 
separable but not, lo not locally compact metric space. But this will not be very important for us. A measurable structure will be more important. So a point process is nothing but a Borel measure on point process is nothing but a Borel measure. P is Borel measure on the space of configurations. So this is quite normal on the space of configurations. Uh, the point is uh, rather, the, the point in, in comparison with this representation that we don't fix our attention on random variables such as number of particles in zero T or something like this, but just, so to speak, on the configuration itself. And uh, I will always assume that all these integrables, all these random variables are integrable. And in fact, this expectation with respect to P of this random variable is the intensity of the process. I, uh, I will denote it like this psi pi of P. This is intensity. This is precisely the average number of particles in some set. So for example, for Poisson process, intensity is just Lebesgue measure. OK. A excuse me? P is a probability measure. Yes, excuse me. Borel, thank you very much. Borel probability. But this one, no. This one is not finite. Borel probability measure. Yes, thank you very much. Borel probability measure. Thank you. Any further, maybe questions or? So if not, we proceed. So then the Campbell measure to this. So uh, configuration is a, an unordered collection of particles. For a finite collection of particles, this is immaterial. One can order them in any way one likes. For an infinite collection of particles, this is important. It is not possible to choose a particle out of a configuration in any nice way. So, in fact, uh, the construction of Campbell measure is the construction of natural lift. Natural lift of my measure to these configura to marked configurations, to configurations with a marked point. So, in fact, we consider the space E times space of configuration on E. And the Campbell measure, C, so Campbell measure of Campbell measure of P takes a subset B in E, takes a subset Z in the space of configurations, and assigns to them the following number. So this is definition of the Campbell measure. Okay. So uh, this definition, it's easy to represent geometrically. So if I horizontally represent the space of configurations and vertically I represent the, or E, well, my E will mostly be R, but this is E, then just on the space of configurations, I have my initial point process P. And over every configuration, I just put the configuration itself, which is an excellent measure. And so this, the resulting object, is Campbell measure. At this point, palm measures are uh, Palm measures are just conditional measures of this measure. This measure is infinite, but it is locally finite. If we restrict it to any uh, bounded set here, it is finite. So, uh, because on here it is finite. So, conditional measure of this measure with fixed particle here is just called the palm measure. It is also possible to write it in the following way, that by Q of some subset Z is the radon nicodym derivative of, of what? Of the Campbell measure where I fix this as a placeholder and I fix Z. So this is now a measure on E on the phase space. So this is the variable. 
with respect to the intensity of my process at the point Q. So it is possible to write this formula, but I think it is more convenient just to say that uh, palm measure is just conditional measure uh, in the sense of Rochlin. So just this is very nice space, there are very nice measures, there are conditional measures, and this, the conditional measure is precisely called the palm measure. So this uh, simple and beautiful construction gives a very general description of palm measures. Of course, it is clear that uh, this coincides with this, uh, the, the new construction coincides with the old one, because in fact, this is just a formula for computing the radon nicotine derivative. So it's quite clear, but this object, this construction is much more convenient to work with. So, and one last thing that I want to, uh, I, okay, one last thing that I, that I want to explain in, gen, in this level of generality is the concept of reduced pump measure. Reduced pump measure. So, in fact, reduced pump measure. So, in fact, uh, what happens... No. There is something... Sorry, say again? There's something I shouldn't, I shouldn't stay here. Interesting. Okay. So, what happens is that uh, just... It is not convenient for me to have this particle at the point Q. So, pump measure is conditional measure with respect to the event that I have this particle at Q. This is formal definition. But it is convenient for me to erase this particle at Q. So just I consider, so I consider uh, palm measure. Palm measure is supported. Palm measure is supported on the set of configurations. Is supported on X such that Q belongs to X. But it's convenient to kick this Q out. You might think, how is this possible? If here I put these cues, then if I kick them all out, what is the fiber? But in fact, no. It becomes precisely much more delicate. The fiber starts to consist of those. The fiber becomes... Maybe, in fact, uh, I, should, I should just switch, switch the mic off, because like this. Sorry? It's staked. Ah, it's staked. Okay. So, uh, so just... Okay, so uh, just uh, it, uh, the, so if the fibers of this, okay, ex excuse me, let me just say. So uh, in fact, I will do, uh, so it is convenient. Now remove the particle, remove the particle, the particle at Q and obtain Reduced pump measure. Reduced pump measure. Reduced pump measure. So at this point, again, the fiber over given configuration will be those configurations from which you can remove by removing one particle fall into this configuration. So it becomes very subtle conditional measure of this reduced thing. Okay, now I will do something really terrible. Uh, so, in fact, in what follows, I will not need actual palm measures. I will only need reduced palm measures. So, I will change notation in the middle of the talk. So, I will put hat. So, palm measure is with hat to, and obtain reduced palm measure and this will be PQ without hat. Because, in fact, it's the reduced palm measure which is important for us. Okay, so now, uh, palm measures will, uh, now I will explain, uh, I will explain uh, the computation of palm measures and the use of palm measures for study of a very specific model. Namely, the model of determinantal point processes arising in random matrix theory. So let me start by specific example. A specific example. And this is the most classical example of random matrix theory, the sign process. The 
sign posts. So I will, the sign process is a point process on R. Uh, and let me give its definition in a slightly uh, uh, short way, but equivalent to uh, uh, just, so to speak, in a somewhat reduced way, but in fact equivalent to the full definition. So, in fact, si so sign process is point process on R. Process is measure, measure on space of configurations on R. So, and to defi define this measure, I need to define uh, some uh, expectations of some events. And events I will take are the following. I will take some disjoint intervals. Disjoint intervals in R, disjoint intervals. Okay, and then I will take the expectation of the product of these numbers. So in fact, it is uh, necessary just so, and this is where I'm skipping some details, but in fact, point process is completely determined by such expectations. So, difference is that I am not taking, uh, ideally, I should also take powers. So, not just, so these are some random variables, but to determine them completely, I should take not just their products, but also products of their squares, of their third powers, and so on. And I don't do this, but in fact, this is enough to define term, the point process. And so, this is given by the determinant of what is called the sine kernel. So, excuse me, integral. Excuse me, integral. Integral over I1, IK of the determinant S Xi, Xj Dx1, Dxk. So, determinant is from Ij, Ij from 1 to K. And uh, uh, so it only is necessary to explain what the sine kernel is. And in fact, uh, the sine kernel is just this function. So it takes considerable effort to show, the, to prove even that such process exists. This was established following pioneering work of McKee. This was established independently and simultaneously by Soshnikov and by Shirai and Takahashi. <coughs> and uh, uh, just uh, so this process is absolutely fundamental object in the theory of random matrices in that it describes the local behavior of eigenvalues of random Hermitian matrix. The important difference between the sign process and uh, the process that we considered before is that the, the range of interaction of particles is very long. Particles interact at infinite distance. So, uh, as opposed to, for example, Poisson process where particles, so to speak, don't see each other, calls arrive independently. Here, particles interact at arbitrarily long distance. So, in fact, sign process, in some sense, models the gas of uh, charged Particles, so particles repel each other. Particles have the property of repulsion. And so now I'm ready to formulate the main result of the talk. So uh, the main result is description of conditional measures of the sign process with respect to fixed exterior in interior or in a bounded interval. 
So, okay, so uh, for the formulation of main result, one can forget everything that went on before. It's, so to speak, fresh start. I will explain the connection with palm theory a little bit later. So, uh, conditional measures of the sign process, conditional measures of the sign process, of the sign process, so what conditional measures do we consider? Again, we take interval i, and we fix the exterior. We fix our configuration in the exterior of the interval. So this is fixed. 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 And then we're interested in distribution of uh, particles in this bounded interval i. Okay, and this is uh, the result that I will now formulate. Uh, it's on the archive, uh, the re archive in May of this year, and uh, uh, just uh, let me just introduce some notation. So this conditional measure, I will imagine that I have some configuration X in the whole R, X configuration on R. X is configuration on R. So then the measure, the measure P, X R complement I is the conditional measure measure of P with Uh, with, how do you say, configuration, configuration in exterior in R without I, fixed as X restricted to R without I. So this is the, this is the definition. This is the definition. Okay, so now I give uh, the description. Uh, so the result says that for almost ever, for, so this measure, let me denote the pi s will be the sign process. So for pi s, almost every x, every x, the conditional measure uh, is an orthogonal polynomial ensemble, orthogonal polynomial ensemble, that is, that is, has the form, the following form. So uh, it's important to note that the measure is supported on configurations with fixed number of particles, with fixed number of particles. So if x had, let's say, 10 particles in i, then the measure will be supported on the set of configurations with 10 particles. So fixed number of particles. Then there is interaction. So uh, this uh, uh, property is, can be understood as some analog of Gibbs property. So then there is interaction between particles. What is interaction between particles? It is, in fact, the interaction as in 
log gas. So potential of the interaction is uh, log of the distance between the particles. Okay, and then there is uh, how to say one particle potential. So rho, which I denote by rho, i x x i d x i. I from 1 to this number. And of course, there is some normalization constant. Just so that this be a probability measure. So, this orthogonal polynomial ensemble, now I just need to explain what is the weight. So, the weight, and this is the main part, the weight, rho, I will be determined by the following formula, rho i of x pi, rho i of x q, is equal to the product, p minus x, q minus x, square over x in precisely r minus i. So this is, uh, it is important to understand only in what sense product is understood. So such product is understood in principal value. So product is understood as convergent over increasing sequences of intervals. Over increasing sequences of intervals. So, so again, is just a normalization constant so that it's probability measure. So a conditional measure is probability measure. It's just constant. Sorry? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, this is not uh, so. Uh, ah, oh, excuse me. OK, let, oh, you're completely right. C inverse, OK. C inverse, OK. C inverse. Okay? Okay. Okay, yes. So the point is that the, uh, the measure is supported on uh, particles with fixed number configuration in this interval, but in fact, this is um, mm, uh, fixed, number of configura uh, fixed number of particles in this interval. This fixed number is just, uh, this statement is due to Gauche and Perez. But also, in fact, uh, for, for uh, this kind of stationary process, it follows from very old theorem of Kolmogorov uh, in 1927. So for stationary, for stationary processes, it is uh, the fact, this fact, that the number of particles is fixed which might, seem, which might seem surprising, that just it's not possible to add one more particle. In fact, can be traced back to a very old result of Kolmogorov. Kolmogorov was interested in the following problem. We have stationary process, xn, n indexed by some integers, and uh, we are interested in a situation when x0 is in linear span of xn for n not equal to 0. So x0 is in linear span of x1, x minus 1, x2, x minus 2, x3, x minus 3, and so on. And so in fact, Kolmogorov gives sufficient conditions for such situation to arise. These sufficient conditions are given in terms of spectral density. And this can be, uh, without much trouble, verified for the sign process. In fact, uh, this is an approach to rigidity for stationary process that uh, we take in joint work with uh, Dabrowski and Xiu, so from 2015. So, and uh, just it, from this theorem, it's possible to deduce these rigidity results. However, the approach of Gauche and Perez is much more flexible in that it can be used for many non-stationary, for many non-stationary processes. Okay, and, uh, uh,
uh, now uh, the uh, main point is uh, once the number of particles is fixed is how to find precisely the interaction between different tuples of particles. And this is exactly where the palm measure, the palm theory comes in. Okay, I need to erase something. Uh, so, okay, let me erase the uh, basic definitions. So uh, the uh, how to find conditional measures. Let us assume that we already have this property of rigidity of Gaussian pairs in this case. Uh, so, how to find the conditional measure in my situation? So, we know that the number of particles in the interval is fixed. Number of particles in the interval is fixed. So, uh, the exterior is fixed also, and the number of particles is fixed. So we are interested in ratio of probabilities, so of particles in these positions and maybe of particles in those positions. So these are P1 and so on PL, and these are Q1 and so on QL. Q1 and so on QL. So, at this point, uh, we have uh, just the following. That, in fact, um, let, uh, let me assume that my conditional measure has density lambda P1 PL, dP1 dPL. Then, in fact, lambda P1 PL over lambda Q1 QL is essentially equal to the ratio of the corresponding palm measures. Considered precisely at the restriction of my configuration to the complement of my interval. This is some sort of bias formula. Just Fixing this and moving this is similar to fixing this, the p's, and then fixing the q's, and taking the ratio at this. It's very instructive to check this equality for finite sets. Even for finite sets, it's not difficult, but it's, it gives an idea of what happens here. So, in fact, uh, the main uh, step in... Uh, the argument in the proof is precisely the computation of this equivalence of palm measures, which uses, uh, so, characterization of palm measures of such processes, which is due again to Shirai and Takahashi, uh, who described palm measures, gave description of palm measures for determinantal processes. Palm measures for determinantal processes. And uh, um, just from this, from this uh, description, it is then possible to obtain this result on conditional measures. There are some technical issues about which I must speak very briefly. Uh, the technical difficulty is that, in fact, 
it, is, it requires proof that this measure does indeed have a density. A priori, it contradicts nothing that the conditional measure is just atomic. The measure is just atomic, but these atomic measures average in such a way uh, that uh, the resulting measures are uh, absolutely continuous. Or put in other way, it is, different, it is different to say that for fixed P and fixed Q, these measures are equivalent. And to say that for this fixed exterior, these measures are equivalent for all P and all Q. There is just some interchange of quantifiers, which is difficult uh, in probability theory because one, takes to, one has to take continuum, continuum union of events of measure zero. It's completely not obvious that this should, have, should be indeed of measure zero, uh, event of measure zero. But this precisely is what goes into the proof. Uh, and let me close uh, by an open problem. So it is natural question. So this, is, this property can be understood as analog of Gibbs property for, this, for the sign process. In fact, this form of conditional distribution is similar to the form that arises in Gibbs theory. Uh, the problem, however, is, the problem, however, is uh, of course, the question of the uniqueness of state. So, is it possible to prove that, in fact, this description of conditional measures and maybe some other, some other, uh, additional, some other additional information, for example, here in this description of conditional measures, the frequency of the sign process, the frequency of particles does not appear. So, for example, this description plus frequency of particles. So, is it possible, is, is it possibly true that uh, this description of conditional measures, in fact, determines the sign process uniquely. This is not known. Thank you very much.